For much of the last century, the history of black Africa was often told in a dull, lifeless way, reduced to lists of dates rather than the vibrant stories of a rich and diverse continent. Few have truly explored the depth of African societies or brought their past to life in a way that connects with us today, while still being rooted in historical accuracy. The historical records we have, especially those concerning West Africa, offer a vivid and continuous story that's waiting to be told. It's time to unlock these stories, to break free from the chains that have kept African history frozen and forgotten. In this video, we will dive into the majestic empires of Imperial West Africa, the powerful kingdoms of Ghana, or Wagadu, as it was rightfully known, Mali and Songhai. We'll breathe life into their histories and explore the legacies they left behind. Until the lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. The story of the Ghana Empire's beginning comes from the historical details in the respected book, Tariq al-Sudan, History of the Sudan. This book gives us insight into the intelligent and inventive Soninkai people. The Soninkai people were the masterminds who laid the foundation of what would later become the Golden Ghana Empire around the fourth century AD. The Soninkai people originally came from Egypt, specifically from Swene, now known as Aswan. The name Soninkai means those who come from Suene. Their ancestral leader, Dinga, is said to have left Egypt and settled in West Africa. The Soninkai, with their superior iron weapons and diplomatic skills, conquered large territories, creating a vast state. This marked the beginning of the African imperial era. It is worth noting that the original name of this empire, Wagadu, was gradually replaced by Ghana, meaning gold. The Berbers, predominantly black then, gave this name to the empire. In honor of this ancient and illustrious state, President Kwame Nkrumah named the then Gold Coast, Ghana. Modern day Ghana and the ancient Ghana empire do not share a common geographic territory. Nonetheless, the Akan, the predominant ethnic group in modern day Ghana, has deep Soninkai roots. In accordance with African tradition, Power was passed down matrilineally, meaning the king's sister's son was next in line after the king's passing. The king led a structured government with ministers and governors overseeing major cities, even those with significant white Muslim populations. The empire had a sophisticated tax system that mainly taxed trade and property of foreigners. The empire's wealth primarily came from its abundant gold resources so much so that gold was nearly considered worthless. Wagadu was synonymous with gold. The Arab traveler Ibn Hawqal, who traveled across the Arab world, Asia and Europe, described the emperor as the richest in the world because of gold. Gold dust was used as currency in the bustling markets. Wagadu's wealth was known as far away as Baghdad, the capital of the Arab world. The life of the emperor known as Kaya Magan or Tunka Ra, was as structured as that of the Egyptian pharaohs. In the morning, he would tour his capital on horseback. During this time, anyone with a complaint could approach him to present their case, which he would address. It is said that the Kaya Magan would walk the same route alone in the afternoon, and no one was allowed to speak to him. The capital of ancient Ghana was called Kumbi Saleh, the vibrant heart of the empire. Kumbi Saleh was divided into two distinct cities. One was the royal city, a luxurious playground for the rich and powerful, where the king's palace glittered with gold. The other was a bustling cosmopolitan center for Muslim traders, full of mosques and lively bazaars. The Spanish Arab scholar Al-Bakri described the cities of Ghana in the 11th century as stone cities. The emperor lived in a fortified castle adorned with sculptures, paintings, and glass. According to Al-Bakri, the central part of the city, called El Gaba, was where the king lived. Protected by a stone wall, it served as the royal and spiritual capital of the empire. Within El Gaba was a sacred grove of trees where priests resided, and the king's palace, the grandest building in the city, was surrounded by other domed structures. It is said that the king would sit on a throne of gold and watch as 10,000 of his subjects were invited to eat in the palace each day. 
The Arab chronicler might have exaggerated this number, but it indicates the enormous size of the palace. The supreme rulers of this grand empire were known as the Kaya Maghans, which translates to King of Gold. This title was fitting since they controlled the gold mines. It's rumored that their dogs even wore golden collars, possibly making them the most high-status pets ever. The Ghana Empire thrived on trade, benefiting from its strategic position between the salt mines of the Sahara and the gold mines of West Africa. This control over trans-Saharan trade routes brought immense wealth and cultural exchanges. Islamic culture, introduced by Muslim traders, significantly influenced the capital city, Kumbi Saleh, which featured exclusive Muslim areas. Forms of currency exchange included salt, cowries, and gold. Gold could be in the form of dust or pieces from foreign or local mints. It might seem surprising that blocks of salt were used as currency, but it's important to remember that particular commodities like salt and copper were rare in the region, while gold was abundant. In some regions, copper jewelry was even more valued than gold. Indeed, gold was cheaper than copper in Nubia, now Sudan. According to the scholar Al-Bakri, salt was as valuable as gold among the El Feruan people in northern Senegal, near Lake Gears. As with all commercial goods, the value of a commodity is dependent on its availability and demand. Cowries, which came from the Indian Ocean via Persia, also served as currency. This was not because these societies could not produce coins of gold or other metal, for coinage was widespread in Black Africa then. Some tribes in southwest Ghana were known to have engaged in barter trade since the Carthaginian period. Arab traveler Ibn Yakut provides accounts of this practice lasting until the 12th century. For these tribes, barter was the foundation of all commercial activity. When Arab traders crossed the desert from Ghana to Upper Senegal, they would unload their goods on the banks of the Falame River, signal their presence, and then retreat. The Africans would place the amount of gold dust they thought the goods were worth in front of each bundle and withdraw. If the Arabs were satisfied with the amount of gold, they would take it. Otherwise, the process would repeat without direct contact. Sociologists and ethnologists agree that commerce conducted this way excludes the concept of merchandise as we understand it today. In this context, gold was not even considered money, but a local product traded for foreign goods. The Almoravids were puritanical invaders from North Africa who disrupted the peace of the Ghana Empire. In the 11th century, they launched an ambitious attempt to seize Aldergost, a key trading hub, marking the beginning of the empire's decline. The invasion by the Almoravid movement, composed of Islamized Berber blacks, led to nearly a decade of looting and atrocities that severely weakened the empire. Additionally, the Islamization of the elites disrupted the traditional matrilineal transmission of power, leading to internal power struggles. The forced conversion efforts to Islam failed, causing many people to flee the region. This weakened state lost control of its lucrative gold mines at Wangara, significantly diminishing its wealth. Environmental changes also contributed to the empire's decline. The once green and fertile landscapes began to turn into the expanding Sahara Desert, leading to a prolonged drought that further hampered the empire's prosperity. During this period of turmoil, he created a power vacuum which was filled by the ambitious Sumanguru Kante in 1203. Known as the Sorcerer King, he ruled the Soso Kingdom and was famed in West African tradition for his supposed magical powers. Legend has it that Sumanguru possessed a sacred balafon, a type of wooden xylophone, that granted him immense power and made his armies invincible. This mix of magic, cunning, and military strategy helped him seize control of the Ghana Empire and establish his own rule. However, Sumanguru's reign was short-lived. He is best known for his defeat at the Battle of Karina in 1235 against Sundiata Keita, the founder of the Mali Empire. The story of Sundiata's victory varies, steeped in oral history and legend, often blending historical events with myth and symbolism. The epic of Sundiata has been preserved in West Africa for centuries. We will recount this epic next. In some versions of the epic of Sundiata, it is said that Sundiata defeated Sumanguru by stealing his sacred balafon, which was believed to be the source of Sumanguru's magical powers. Other versions mention that Sundiata 
used a special silent arrow, an arrow without a tip, to defeat Sumanguru. This arrow didn't kill Sumanguru, but caused him to vanish, allowing Sundiata to emerge victorious during the Battle of Karina. Both accounts share the core idea that Sundiata triumphed over Sumanguru through bravery, strategy, and a bit of trickery. Sundiata Keita effectively ended the Sorcerer King's reign and established the Mali Empire. In 1242, Sundiata Keita, the king of the outer province of Mali, seized control of the territory of Ghana. Sundiata Keita, also known as Marijata, whose name means lion in Mandingo, was the first powerful monarch of Mali. He defeated the Sosos and stripped them of their sovereignty. Sundiata Keita is renowned as one of the greatest empire builders in black African history. After subduing the Sosos, Mali replaced Ghana as the dominant power. Mali experienced a period of turmoil and political instability, during which traditional succession rules were temporarily ignored. The golden age of Imperial Africa occurred with the succession of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. Let's examine the military organization of these empires. In the kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, the king was the commander-in-chief of the army and personally led military operations. The armies in these kingdoms were organized into several corps, each assigned to defend different provinces and under the command of the civil authorities. Provincial governors had parts of the army at their disposal, with tasks assigned by military generals. The sophistication of the armies of Imperial Africa reached their zenith during the Songhai Empire. The Songhai army included knights, cavalry, foot soldiers, Tuareg auxiliaries, elite infantry regiments, the Royal Guard, and an armed flotilla. African knights wore full armor, including mail coats, iron breastplates, helmets, and boots. Due to the climate, armor was not as common as in Europe, but it was still used. Some of this armor was likely imported from Europe, with some African blacksmiths crafting replicas suited to the local climate. The cavalry was composed of mounted soldiers armed with shields and spears. They were known for their formidable power, which terrified their enemies. During a battle against Morocco in 1609, the noise of their shields clashing against the horses' legs caused the Moroccan army to panic and flee. The foot soldiers were primarily archers. An elite corps, distinguished by gold bracelets, was known for its bravery. In a battle worthy of its own story against Sultan Judah of Morocco, this elite group chose to be decapitated rather than flee the battlefield. Oral history shows they could not turn their backs on the enemy. The army also included a band with drums, trumpets, and cymbals. These instruments were used to boost morale and signal movements during battles. An auxiliary corps consisted of Tuareg camel drivers and infantry armed with long spears. The Tuaregs wore puffed trousers, tunics, turbans, and lithums. It is worth noting that a flotilla of small, stable boats was used for military purposes on the famous Niger River. You might be wondering, what about firearms? For example, the Songhai army lacked firearms, which was a significant disadvantage, leading to its downfall. Indeed, attempts to acquire them were thwarted by European and Arab traders who exploited this weakness. Griots are West African historians, storytellers, praise singers, poets, and musicians who preserve oral traditions and serve as advisors to royalty. They play a crucial role in maintaining the history and culture of their people, often accompanying aristocratic families and recounting significant events, like births, deaths, marriages, and battles. Griots also act as mediators in disputes and are highly respected for their ability to influence and inspire through their songs and stories. Their musical instruments, such as the kora, balafon, and ngoni, add a unique dimension to their storytelling. Today, griots continue to perform internationally, sharing their rich cultural heritage with the world. We owe our knowledge of the epic of Sundiata and Sumanguru to the tales passed down through generations by the jelly griots. The Mali Empire was established in 1240 AD by Sundiata Keita, 
a prince born around 1217 who conquered the declining Wagadu Empire, also known as Ghana. Known by many titles, including Mari Jata and the Lion of Mali, he laid the foundations for an empire that would flourish under his successors, including his great nephew, Mansa Musa. After a pivotal victory at the Battle of Kirina, Sundiata expanded his empire, taking control of the territories and assets of his defeated foes, including the Soso and their allies. Sundiata's legacy is captured in the Epic of Sundiata, a story cherished through the oral traditions of the Malinkai people and performed by generations of griots. His reign is also noted for the founding of the Mandan Charter, a declaration of universal human rights that may have existed even before the more famous Magna Carta. Notably, the Manda Charta addressed the issue of slavery, which was prevalent due to the spread of Islam at the time. It went beyond mere moral opposition to slavery by laying the groundwork for an emancipatory government, marking it as one of the earliest documents advocating for the abolition of enslavement. It is a significant precursor to later Western declarations celebrated for their roles in promoting liberty and human rights. Mande Charter, or Kurukan Fuga, crafted in the early 13th century under the leadership of Sundiata Keita after his victory at the Battle of Kirina, set out to establish a social order and ethical governance in the newly unified Mali Empire. Unlike the Magna Carta, which was a response to a political crisis in England, the Kurukan Fuga took a proactive stance. It not only addressed broad social issues, from incest prohibition to environmental protection and the humane treatment of prisoners, but also set a precedent for future governance. Rooted in African communalism, the Manda Charter emphasized social, environmental, and ethical issues, showcasing an early grasp of concepts that Western societies would only recognize much later. Despite its progressive nature, the Manda Charter has yet to gain widespread recognition outside academic circles familiar with African history, and its impact on global legal and ethical norms has been limited. This obscurity reflects a broader trend where African contributions are often overlooked in the global historical narrative. The Mali Empire, under the rule of Mansa Musa, was an expansive realm stretching from Gao in the east to the Atlantic Ocean in the west, from the Sahara in the north to the tropical forests in the south. Mansa Musa, a powerful leader, exerted control even over the Sahara and made a renowned pilgrimage to Mecca between 1324 and 1325, boosting Mali's international acclaim during the medieval era. Mansa Kanku Musa is perhaps best known for his lavish pilgrimage to Mecca, including a caravan of 100 camels, each carrying 300 pounds of gold and hundreds of servants and followers. His generous distribution of gold en route to Cairo and Mecca dramatically impacted local economies, even temporarily devaluing gold in these regions. One of the most iconic depictions of Mansa Musa comes from the Catalan Atlas, a medieval map created in 1375 by the Majorcan cartographer Abraham Crescas. This atlas is one of the most important visual documents of medieval Europe and provides a rich illustration of the known world at the time. Mansa Musa's rule also marked significant architectural and educational advancements within Mali. Contrary to some accounts that attribute the construction of the mosques in Gao and Timbuktu to an Arab architect, research by Cheka Anta Diop suggests that these were indigenously designed, showcasing the pyramidal style characteristic of black African architecture seen in Egypt and Nubia. Under his reign, cities like Jene, Timbuktu, and Gao flourished as significant cultural and commercial centers, surpassing North Africa's intellectual and literary output. Mansa Kanku Musa expanded the empire to its territorial peak, ensuring stability and prosperity. The belief that an Arab architect, brought back by Kanku Musa from his travels, built the mosques of Gao and Timbuktu is incorrect. Cheikh Anta Diop has shown that this interpretation misuses historical documents. In reality, the architecture of these mosques showcases the distinct features of black African design, including a pyramidal style similar to those found in Egypt and Nubia, which differs from Arab architectural traditions. What was court life like in ancient Mali? 
We have accounts of foreign travelers to the empire, primarily Arab travelers. The emperor would occasionally grant his subjects an audience. When the audience was to begin, horns and drums summoned the people. 300 soldiers, equipped with bows and spears, arranged themselves in two columns on either side of the emperor. Influential figures took their places in front of the soldiers. The herald stood by the door in traditional attire. He wore boots and was outfitted with a sword in a golden scabbard and two ornate javelins. Additional reports mentioned the emperor positioning himself behind a window, with a linguist acting as an intermediary, relaying grievances to the emperor for decisions. The audience took place on special occasions inside the palace. The emperor's throne was covered in silk and topped with a dome-shaped silk parasol, adorned with a golden bird. This set the stage for the emperor's entrance. Dressed in a gold turban and a red cloak, the emperor would emerge with a bow and quiver. He would be preceded by singers with gold and silver combs and nearly 300 armed soldiers. The emperor would then pause periodically during his procession to his magnificent throne. Before taking his seat, the emperor would perform a ceremonial inspection. As soon as he sat down, the sound of horns, trumpets and drums would fill the air. The linguist would maintain his usual position near the emperor, while the rest of the people remained outside. The session would then commence. The grandeur of the royal court was recounted by various Arab chroniclers who had the opportunity to visit the Mali Empire. In ancient times, religious and secular powers were closely intertwined. However, with the rise of Christianity and Islam, a separation between these powers began to emerge. Interestingly, a significant change occurred when Islam took root in Africa. Rulers typically ceased performing religious functions and were increasingly seen as mere secular leaders. As Islam spread, the spiritual authority traditionally held by African kings transferred to the emerging Muslim clergy, often from lower social classes. This clergy then came to embody religious sanctity, while the kings represented the secular aspects of governance, administrative duties. The implications of the separation of religious and secular powers played a significant role in destabilizing various Muslim empires in Africa. The Muslim clergy, for example, plotted against the great Soni Ali Ber of the Songhai Empire because he was seen as a secular leader with little interest in promoting Islam. We will take a deeper look at this in the next chapter. Most people familiar with the history of Imperial Africa know about the great Mansa Musa, but did you know about the ruler who ruled Mali before Musa? In the 14th century, the wealthy and influential Mali Empire under the leadership of Emperor Abu Bakari II, sought to conquer the seas. Initially, he launched an ambitious expedition with 200 ships loaded with provisions to cross the Atlantic, but this ended tragically as only one ship returned. Unperturbed, Abu Bakari II personally led a second, more extensive fleet of an estimated 2,000 ships. Though it remains unclear if he reached America, Christopher Columbus later noted evidence suggesting pre-existing trade relations between Africa and America. Indeed, modern experiments like Thor Heyerdahl's 1970 Ra-2 expedition, where he successfully crossed the Atlantic in a boat made of papyrus reeds from Africa to Barbados. This proves the fact that Africans could have easily crossed the Atlantic Ocean. It is worth noting that the Atlantic Ocean is more than just a vast body of water. It is a complex system of currents acting like rivers within the sea capable of transporting objects and historically boats across great distances without the need for manual propulsion. Following Abu Bakari the Seku's departure, Kanku Musa, famously known as Mansa Musa, ascended to the throne in 1312. Most narratives about the history of Mali focus on the reign of Mansa Musa, one of the wealthiest and most powerful rulers in history. However, the story did not end with his rule. Let's dive into the fascinating aftermath of Mansa Musa's era through the eyes of Ibn Battuta, a man who embarked on an epic journey that surpassed even Marco Polo's famed travels. In 1353 AD, Battuta journeyed to the Mali Empire, driven by curiosity about Mali's devout Islamic culture. 
Arab traders had introduced Islam to the region around 1200 AD, and it had become deeply ingrained as the official religion. Arriving in the capital, local dignitaries warmly received Batuta, including the city's Qadi, who provided him with lodging and support. Batuta suffered a severe illness during his stay, leading him to meet Mansa Sulaiman, the successor to Mansa Musa. Unfortunately, Sulaiman's miserly disposition left Batuta disillusioned, diminishing his once idealistic views of Mali's rulers. Conversely, in his encounters with the citizens of Mali, Batuta observed their admirable traits, just governance and strict adherence to prayer. He also experienced the exuberance of their festivals, where extravagant displays of wealth, music and dance played out under the king and his court's gaze. The fall of the Mali Empire is a complex tale that began with the death of the legendary Mansa Musa in 1337. He left a legacy of prosperity, but his successors faced numerous challenges that eventually led to the empire's decline. Mansa Musa's son, Mansa Maganves, initially took the throne, followed by his brother Mansa Suleiman, who may have seized power through dubious means. Under Mansa Suleiman, Mali remained a flourishing center of the Islamic faith. Still, its fortunes began to wane with the discovery of new gold mines and the redirection of major trade routes. By the mid-15th century, internal strife, including civil wars and territorial disputes, weakened the empire's foundations. External threats increased as the Tuaregs, a nomadic group, attacked key cities. And King Soni Ali of the Songhai Empire sought to dismantle Mali to expand his territories. Despite these challenges, the Mali Empire continued to thrive culturally and intellectually during its heyday. Cities like Timbuktu, Jene, and Walata became bustling commercial centers known for their impressive architectural developments, such as universities and mosques. The reconstruction of the Great Mosque in Jene by Mason Guild leader Ismaila Traore is a notable example of Mali's architectural achievements. Leo Africanus, a 16th century scholar, described Timbuktu in his book Description of Africa as a thriving metropolis filled with merchants and well-built stone structures. However, by the mid-14th century, the empire's influence began to decline, and the Songhai Empire emerged to fill the power vacuum, eventually annexing key cities like Timbuktu. Songhai, originally a modest kingdom during the Wagadu Empire and later a vassal state of the Mali Empire, became independent with its capital in Gao. Under the leadership of Soni Ali Ber, the 15th king of the Soni dynasty, Songhai expanded dramatically over 28 years to become one of the largest states of the African imperial era. Soni Ali capitalized on the declining Mali Empire to extend his domain. He successfully defended against various enemies, and eventually conquered key cities like Timbuktu in 1468 AD and Jene in 1473 AD after a prolonged siege. These conquests allowed Soni Ali to control the lucrative river trade along the Niger, bringing most of Mali under his rule. However, his adherence to traditional African animist beliefs, rather than Islam, drew criticism and hostility from Muslim scholars who labeled him a tyrant and plotted against him. Soni Ali's casual approach to Islamic practices, such as delaying prayers or simplifying them, further alienated the Muslim elite. His reign ended with his death in 1492, amid rumors that he was poisoned by his lieutenant, Mohammed Touré. Mohammed Touré, who became Askia Mohammed, was born into a Soninkai family. Before becoming the emperor at the peak of the Songhai Empire's power, he served as an army lieutenant, administrator, and governor of Hombori, during the rule of Soni Ali Ber, the founder of the Songhai Empire. His title at this time was Hombori Khoi. Mohammed was among the Muslim elites who disagreed with Soni Ali's adherence to African religious belief systems. Following Soni Ali's death, his son Soni Baru openly continued the practice of African religion, which intensified the opposition from Muslim groups. This religious conflict, a pivotal moment in the history of the Songhai Empire, led to Soni Baru's death at the hands of Mohammed Touré, who then established the Askia dynasty, marking the end of the Soni dynasty and a shift in the religious orientation of the Songhai Empire. Askia Muhammad became the emperor of Songhai under questionable circumstances, having seized the throne through a determined and ambitious coup. 
To solidify his claim and enhance his legitimacy, he undertook a significant pilgrimage to Mecca with a large entourage, bringing 300,000 gold coins, a third of which he donated as alms in Mecca and Medina. During his pilgrimage, he was recognized as the Caliph of Sudan, which refers to a large region in Africa, not just the modern country of Sudan. The term Sudan in Arabic translates to land of the blacks or black. This name reflects the region's geographical position in Africa, just south of the Sahara Desert, inhabited predominantly by communities with darker skin tones. This reflects the displacement of blacks from Northern Africa over the centuries due to conquests dating from the time of foreign invaders, such as the Hittites, Greeks, and later Mohammedans. Askia Muhammad adopted a militant approach to expand his empire, engaging in numerous wars with a jihadist zeal. He successfully captured the salt mines of Tagaza in the Sahara and numerous Hausa fortified towns in the southeast. He extended the Songhai Empire to parts of what is present-day Niger and expanded as far west as the Atlantic Ocean, including regions in Senegambia. Despite his military successes, Askia Muhammad faced resistance in spreading Islam. For example, when he ordered the Mossi to convert to Islam, they outright refused. Additionally, his attempts to conquer the kingdoms to the south were unsuccessful, resulting only in the plundering of markets. Nevertheless, his campaign significantly expanded Songhai, covering nearly two million square kilometers at its peak. Domestically, the emperor strictly enforced Islamic laws. Askia Muhammad sought to improve the lives of the lower caste of dependents by significantly reducing their taxes. However, he controversially sold people from this caste to acquire horses to support his military efforts. Strict adherence to Islam meant non-believers or infidels were subject to slave raids, a practice which introduced significant instability in the region. Education saw notable advancements under the rule of Askia Muhammad, enhancing Timbuktu's stature. The University of Sankora in Timbuktu, flourishing with thousands of students, became a renowned learning center during this period. It produced distinguished scholars who significantly contributed to the humanities, exact sciences, and medicine. Physicians in Timbuktu performed successful cataract surgeries. Under the leadership of Mohamed Touré, Timbuktu's reputation for scholarly excellence and cultural significance reached a global audience. The Sankor Mosque was one of three key institutions that formed the university complex in the city of Timbuktu, which greatly benefited from Askia Mohammed's rule. Under his leadership, Timbuktu's global reputation flourished. Askia Mohammed actively developed domestic and international economic exchanges and strengthened the Songhai Empire's tax, duty, and regulatory systems. Timbuktu and Jene and Gao became thriving commercial centers of an increasingly wealthy empire with trade routes secured by a robust military. The army and navy were formidable, with knights donning iron mail armor. The Askia administered the empire with a sophisticated system inherited from local traditions. He organized the empire into provinces, managed by provincial governors known as Fari, a title derived from the Egyptian per a, -a pharaoh. Key cities were governed by officials known as Farba, Monzo, and especially Khoi a term historically used for kings in Sudan during the Pharaonic era. The Khoi served as administrative and military chiefs and were supported by territorial guards. The ministers, known as Pharma, specialized in different areas, with titles like Sao Pharma for forest affairs and Lari Pharma for water management. The administration also included police commissioners called Asaramundio and traditional judges known as Anfarakuma. This intricate administrative structure was distinctly African. In his later years, blind and elderly, Mohammed Touré, Askia Mohammed, was deposed by his son Musa amid disputes over succession. He passed away at 95, leaving a legacy of having elevated the Songhai Empire to its zenith. The Songhai Empire boasted a formidable military structure characterized by various divisions, including knights, cavalry, foot soldiers, elite infantry regiments, a royal guard, auxiliary bodies of Tuaregs, and an armed flotilla. The knights, often princes of black Africa who could afford it, wore armor comparable to that of Western medieval knights, including chainmail and iron breastplates. Instances of combat demonstrated the use of such armor. For example, during internal conflicts, protective gear like iron helmets played crucial roles in battles. The cavalry, 
composed of more modest means, was equipped with shields and spears, proving highly effective in warfare, particularly noted for causing panic among foot soldiers, including an elite corps distinguished by gold bracelets, primarily armed with bows and arrows. This group was known for their courage, often choosing death over retreat in battle, demonstrating profound loyalty and bravery. The Empire also maintained a flotilla on the Niger River, utilized for military purposes during conflicts, playing strategic roles in controlling movements across the river. The Royal Guard was a robust unit where vassal princes' sons served alongside nobility, ensuring the king's safety and the empire's security. The griots, traditional storytellers, and musicians held significant sociological importance within the army. They spurred warriors to act bravely through their songs and poems, highlighting their indispensable role in boosting morale and influencing the course of battles. The Songhai Empire's military strategy relied heavily on its elite cavalry, supported by versatile infantry equipped with traditional weapons and firearms. Control of the Niger River and fortified cities provided strategic advantages for the Songhai army. Despite their military strength, the Songhai forces lacked firearms, a critical disadvantage that European and Arab powers exploited to conquer the empire. This lack of advanced weaponry eventually contributed to the empire's vulnerability in facing external threats. The Battle of Tondibi in 1591 was the decisive clash during the Moroccan invasion of the Songhai Empire, leading to the empire's downfall. Under Judah Pasha, the Moroccan forces defeated the Songhai, led by Askia Ishak II. Previously, the Songhai Empire had dominated Western Africa, stretching from the Senegal River to present-day Niger. However, succession conflicts following the 1586 death of Askia al hajj weakened the empire. Meanwhile, the Sa'adi dynasty in Morocco, having repelled a Portuguese invasion in 1578, faced financial strains and sought new resources. The Sa'adi dynasty of Morocco attacked the Songhai Empire primarily to gain control over the lucrative trans-Saharan trade routes, particularly those dealing in gold and salt. The Moroccan Sultan, Ahmad al-Mansur, sought to boost his kingdom's wealth and consolidate power by seizing Songhai's rich resources. In October 1590, Moroccan Sultan Ahmad Fui al-Mansur dispatched Judar Pasha to invade Songhai, believing it rich in gold mines. The army, equipped with modern firearms and cannons, journeyed for four months, reaching the Niger River by February 1591. They first attacked and plundered the salt mines at Tagaza before advancing towards Gao. Moroccan forces consisted of 2,500 cavalry and 2,500 infantry, many armed with arquebuses. The Songhai forces, significantly larger, included up to 80,000 soldiers with a strong cavalry, but lacking in gunpowder weapons. The battle occurred near Tondibi on March 13, 1591. The Songhai's initial strategy involved using cattle to disrupt Moroccan lines, but this failed as the cattle stampeded back towards Songhai lines under the noise of Moroccan gunfire. Despite outnumbering the Moroccans, the Songhai infantry and cavalry were outmatched by the firepower of arquebuses and cannons, leading to a catastrophic defeat within two hours. Following the battle, Judar Pasha sacked Gao and subsequently the trading centers of Timbuktu and Jene, marking the end of the Songhai Empire as a regional power. Morocco struggled to maintain control over the vast territory, leading to a decade of sporadic fighting and the eventual fragmentation of the region into smaller kingdoms. The collapse of the Songhai Empire and the broader African imperial era had profound and lasting effects on the history and development of Africa. The fragmentation and increased warfare contributed to the rise of the Atlantic slave trade. European traders took advantage of the political instability to forge alliances with local leaders, often fueling conflicts to procure slaves for the Americas. This had devastating social and demographic effects on the continent.
Until the lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter.